I don't believe that, uh, you know, Tim has a soul. I don't believe that anything is separate from anything else. On the whole notion of the nature of creativity or even the notion of creativity, you know, whether we call it God or universe or nature, it's intrinsically creative. I mean, the fact that anything happens is an act of creativity. The universe is infinitely creative, but so are human beings. The question is, what do we do with that creativity? Creativity is intrinsic and with it comes danger because danger is, is part of creativity. One thing I would say is that you're the very first um, person that I've had on the channel that, shall we say, is a representative of a specific religious following. So as a rabbi, that's your... <laughs> What is that? That's a lay, label. That's, <laughs> that's, a label. That's, that's that's my label. I'm an ordained rabbi, so I'm Jewish, and uh, you know, I'm I'm, but I'm also somewhat of uh, you know, spiritually a hybrid, maybe or a mutt. I've got Buddhist training and uh, Hindu non-dual Advaita training. Training, so yeah, I'm I'm spiritually not in that rabbinic silo, but that's my background, yeah. Yeah, tell, tell us a little bit more about the, all of that. I mean, very simply, I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish home. I found Orthodoxy, I mean, it was sort of like ancestor worship. You know, it wasn't that my father and mother believed in God and that God chose the Jews and gave us all these commandments to follow. It was my father honored his father and his father honored his father. And we did what our grandfathers told us to do. I don't know if any of them had a, you know, a spiritual understanding of Judaism, but they had a, a religious, a legalistic understanding. So I followed the rules because my father followed the rules and I honored my father and he did the same. But it wasn't fulfilling on a spiritual level. It wasn't it didn't speak to my desire to expand my consciousness. Even in, as a teenager, I was looking for something more expansive. And in high school, you know, I was a, a junior in high school. So I was, I don't know, 17 years old, 16 years old. And two of my teachers spent a summer in India studying Hinduism and Buddhism. And they came back and they started teaching a class in what they called Asian studies. They couldn't call it religion because it was a public school and you couldn't do religion in a public school. But they were teaching what they called Asian studies, but they were teaching Buddhism and Hinduism. And I took the class because I loved these two teachers. And I just fell in love with this, you know, these subjects. And I started diving deeply into both traditions, but more into Buddhism than Hinduism, primarily because Buddhism didn't ask me to believe in anything, at least in the Zen tradition that I was drawn to. It asked me to experience something. And it didn't have a creator God. It didn't have a, a lot of the trappings that Judaism had that I was wrestling with. I didn't believe in the a creator God, certainly not a God that chose the Jews and you know, all that stuff. Uh, so I was drawn to Buddhist as a Buddhism as a practice. Later in life, uh, I was drawn to Hinduism as a theology, non-dual Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Hinduism, which teaches that uh, everything, you and I, all sentient beings, but all non-sentient reality too, that everything is a manifesting of a single dynamic reality that the Hindus would call Brahman. Uh, we might call it God in the West, but whatever you call it, even nature, Tao, mother, you know, there's the languaging around it is, is infinite. But I'm very attracted in the present tense. I'm still very attracted to that idea and shifted more from Buddhism to Hinduism, all the while maintaining my Jewish connection. And then at some point, uh, without going into all the, the ins and outs, but at some point, uh, my Zen teacher uh, suggested that I uh, become a monk and, and, go into the monastery and without any hesitation or any intention, I simply told him I couldn't do that because I was going to become a rabbi. But that was not my plan. 
I, I had a plan. I wanted to be a professor of religion and specifically Buddhism, but I just, it just came out. No, I can't do that because I'm going to be a rabbi. And he said, okay, you know, go be a rabbi. He said, be Zen rabbi. I said, okay, I'll, I'll be Zen rabbi, but I'm not going to be a monk. And I don't, I, it's like my unconscious told me what I was supposed to do. And so I went on that path, but I never lost my interest in Buddhism. I never lost my interest in Hinduism. I began to dis, to to explore Jewish mysticism and discovered that from the mystic dimension, whether it's Jewish, Christian, Muslim, uh, you don't really talk about Hindu mysticism or even Buddhist mysticism, but from whatever tradition you're working in, when you're working at that deep contemplative level, you're always working with the same dynamic, the same non-dual reality manifesting as all existence. And that's what attracts me. So I can talk about it using Hindu language, Buddhist language, Christian, Muslim, or Jewish language. So I found a home in Judaism in that non-dual dimension, if that makes sense. Uh, it, it, it's brilliant. I mean, goodness me, you described yourself, I think, on Buddha at the Guest Bump as somebody that's talked for a living. And uh, that's, <laughs> that's clearly what I apparent. I talk <laughs> that's for a living. <laughs> clearly apparent. And yet you're also author of uh, some 36 or so books. Yeah. 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 I talk. Okay. If you can talk, you can write. I talk and then I type up what I said. <laughs> and they somehow make it into books that make it onto bookshelves. It's, it's, I mean, that's extraordinary. I mean, I say it's, I'm kind of the opposite end. It's taken me about 36 years to want to write one book. So, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm clearly not quite on the same path. Um, so this, you blurted out that you wanted to be a rabbi, that you were going yeah. to be a rabbi. So what did you think when you actually said those words? Yeah, I mean, two things. I mean, first of all, I was as surprised as the, the Roshi, the Zen master, because that was not on my list of things to do. Uh, my first response was, oh, that I must have just said that to get him off my, you know, to back off. Um, because my, in, in actual fact, I went to graduate school the way I planned. But as he predicted, my graduate studies in Buddhism lasted literally a week. I, I quit. I didn't like it. And I went into Jewish studies um, by default, I guess. And then found that it was more to my liking and there was this mystical element that I could pursue. But um, it, it was still something I went into, you know, with a lot of resistance uh, until I met teachers who were rabbis who had this mystical both experience, but also this mystical bent that they felt at home in mystical Judaism. And once that happened, um, and it happened in Israel when I was studying there. It happened in the United States. But once that happened, then I really felt at home because now I didn't have to, I could still honor my father in a sense, you know, by staying with, within the Jewish frame, but I could honor my, and I mean this metaphorically, not literally, I could honor my soul by going into that non-dual dimension of following teachers who who were both Jewish and mystics at the, at the same time. Um, but it was a surprise to me. I mean, honestly, my entire life has been a surprise. <laughs> the 36 <laughs> books have been a surprise. My, my mystical, quote, mystical experiences have been a surprise. None of it could I have predicted when I was starting out on this path at the age of 16. And even when things happen now, it's like, I, I can, it's none of it is, um, the result of anything I've done. It's all, at least in my experience, it's all a matter of grace. I just do what I do. And then once in a while, something happens. And I consider it just a, a, a gift. Okay. Uh, and uh, so this sort of my first question that I want to ask you about that is you actually, you, when you um, referenced your soul, you, you expressed it in metaphorical um, terms. Why, yeah. why so you because i don't you, believe in the soul <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah tell tell tell, yeah. tell me about it yeah please yeah. i i don't i don't believe that anything is separate from anything else oh. so i don't i don't believe that uh you know tim has a soul that somehow labeled 
Tim or Tim's soul. I don't think there's a that Rami has a soul. I think that uh, I like the, the Hindu metaphor of wave and ocean, that there's this infinite ocean that has infinite waves. And one wave, you know, you call it Tim, and one wave I call Rami. And but that there's no soul to any of these waves. It's just the ocean. So when I use the word soul metaphorically to maybe just reference some <laughs> something. I don't even know what it references, but I don't really think there's something in me that is my soul. Because if you look deeply in me, you're just going to find the oceanic. Because you look into a wave, you're just going to find the ocean. So um, all you and I and everything else in the universe, all you and I are, is the ocean happening in infinite diverse form so no no soul separate from right. anything right okay okay excellent i i can kind of i'm sort of aware of of lots of cards of uh higher self and uh, all of these different you know differentiations of aspects of subtle realms they're they're all just kind of waiting here to be uh given a little shelf so um that essence of oneness which is what you're talking about you're talking about everything being completely and utterly linked of the same process you could describe it as 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 life being happening it's a happening it's all happening actually i dipped into your latest book and there was this fantastic uh got right so the oneness that we might want to transpose as God, but maybe in chapter 11, you say God isn't a being or even the supreme being, but being itself. God isn't the creator, but creation and creativity. God is Yahweh. Is that Yahweh? Y-H-B-H? I'm not sure. But, but God is Yahweh, the happening, happening as all happening in with and as the entirety of the universe god doesn't exist god is existence over to you <laughs> that, <laughs> well that. i happen to agree with myself so there you are yeah you know when when we read the hebrew bible i mean most of us read it in translation uh and when you read it in translation you miss some of the deep subtleties of the Hebrew text. And one of the most important parts of the text is, and, and I believe the Bible is a human document. So written by many people over a long period of time. And some of these people were fools and violent, and they wrote horrible things. And they put some horrible things into the mouth of the character they called God. Uh, and some of these people were great mystics who understood but the truth that that you know we've been talking about the oneness and they tried to convey that by putting that idea into the mouth of the character they called god so in the story of the burning bush where moses meets the divine and moses says what's your name you know which is really another way of saying what's your nature what what's your essence what what are you and god responds in two ways the first thing God says is the phrase ehie asher ehie, which we usually translate into English as I am that I am, or I am what I am becoming. And it's not a bad translation. It's just not perfect. It's the best you can do maybe in English without sounding very awkward because ehie is a verb and it's the first person singular of the Hebrew verb to be. So it's, it's, it's more like a gerund. It'd be like eyeing, but you can't say eyeing, you know, what's your name? And God says eyeing, forever eyeing. It just sounds awkward. So we say I am. So, so that's the first uh, thing. So in a sense, the mystic reading of that is God is uh, the eyeing happening is, you know, all reality. God is the eternal uh, subject of or subjectivity of, of the universe, the I that happens as everything else. And then God offers a second name, which is the same verb. It's the unpronounceable yud hey vav hey or y h v h. And 
it's the same verb, but it's the third person. So the first time God reveals the, the nature of the divine, it's from the first person perspective. And then God reveals it from the third person perspective. So there's the eyeing, but then there's the world happening. So that's where I get happening, happening is all happening. It's like if, if um, you know, you were riding a bicycle and uh, someone said to you, Tim, what are you doing? You would say, I'm riding a bicycle because you're speaking from the I space. But if that person, um, you know, if I saw you riding a bicycle and I saw that person watching you ride a bicycle and I said, hey, what's Tim doing? That person would say to me, oh, Tim is riding a bicycle. So you would speak in the first person. They're speaking in the third person. So what you get in this burning bush revelation is God is both the first person happening as all happening and also the third person. So it's just so simultaneously, God is inwardly the eyeing of everything. The ocean happening is all the waves and all the waves. So everything you and I see is the happening of God. When we go deep into the mystic experience, we experience the I instead of myself, right? The, the I of Rami disappears into the I of God. But when that isn't happening, then I see the I of God happening as Rami and Tim and birds and you know everything else in the universe mm -hmm. so 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 that's you know that's my not just my philosophical understanding of god cuz though that would be plenty if that was it but it's my experience of divinity uh, because i i don't i don't have beliefs i don't like the word belief i have experiences you know belief is affirming something to be true without any evidence, right? So people will say, well, I believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. I can't prove it. It's a belief. Well, then it's meaningless to me if you can't prove it because I want proof. But I think you could experience resurrection when you drop the ego I, the egoic I, and you experience the I am. That is the divine. That's a that's rebirth. That's resurrection. And you could say, I've had that experience. Okay, that's a different conversation. But I don't believe anything. So for example, I mean, I could say, I don't say, for example, my sister, I don't say, I believe I have a sister. I know I have a sister. I believe, given what time it is here in the United States and where she lives. I believe my sister is at a Bible study class because I think that's what she does on Thursday morning. So I believe that's where she is. I don't know because maybe something came up or maybe I've got the wrong day, but I believe that's where she is. But I know I have a sister. I don't believe God is X, Y, or Z. I know God is all there is because I've experienced it. It's that kind of certitude. And I know that there are practices that you can find in Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, nature religions, you know, in, in psychology and other things, science. Um, astronauts talk about this when they come back from, from circling the earth and in, in, in outer space. I know there are, there are ways to actually experience this non-dual reality that I'm talking about and that I'm calling God. Directly, you can have this direct experience. So you know what I'm saying is true. You don't take it on faith. You can experience it for yourself. So anyway, so that's what I'm talking about. That was a long answer. But that's, no, that's brilliant. No, absolutely brilliant. I mean, good grief. Okay. <laughs> On the end, they used the word faith, but, but faith suggests a certain amount of trust. Um Okay, let's just move on from that. Let's just, just move on from that because that's I'm going to go around in circles. Um, I, uh, well, you, you, let me let me jump in while you're yeah, thinking of yeah. this because I think you raise an interesting thing when you say faith uh, requires a certain amount of trust. So not everyone's had this experience that I'm talking hmm. about. 
Well, that's maybe not true. Maybe as babies, you might have had it, but we forget. But there are certain people that I've met whose, whose life seems to attest to the truth of what we were talking about, who seem to have had this experience and who, I, from my encounters with them, who live this experience. I'm thinking of people like Father Thomas Keating, um, people like, um, I have a Hindu teacher named Prasanna, um, Rabbi Zalman Shakter Shalomi. I mean, I could go through a list in different traditions, but there are people that I have met and studied with who seem to demonstrate the truth of what I'm saying and whose, whose lives attest to this truth. Even if I didn't have the experience myself, I would trust the experience is true because I trust their the quality of their lives to dem that that demonstrates it, if that if that makes sense. Yeah. So there is there is trust, there is faith in that sense. I don't have faith in a doctrine. I have faith in people that seem to live the truth that they're articulating. So there there is that. Yeah. Okay. And and so and so therefore, it, uh, 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 you didn't um, obviously uh, put yourself in that list because uh, for whatever reasons. But you must live your life from you. You must live your life along those sort of lines that you admire in other people, and that gives you the the the, fast, the faith in everything that you talked about. Surely, I, I would say that I've had an, enough experience to. To, to ratify what I'm saying is true. But because I live my life from the inside, as opposed to people just seeing the performance that I put out there, I know that I'm not really performing, that that what you see on the outside is not as is better than what I know is true on the inside. So it's not, I'm not living up to the show. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but yeah, well, yeah. Okay, but you know, if you were here in person, I'd give you a hug, right? Because it's like that's the that's the essence of every single human being. That's the essence of us in this. I'll use the word resonance in this yeah. situation that we find ourselves. We are we appear to be something in other people's eyes that we certainly don't feel that we are in our own perception of self. So, you know. No, I, I do the best I can, but it's not in no way perfect, right? It's, it's like, okay, well, and, and I'm moving. sure, and I'm sure my teachers would say the same thing about themselves. But I see them on a higher level than they probably see themselves. Okay, yeah. So coming back to your original point about the God in everything and God, let's continue to use that word. So surely, is this saying that 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 effectively, you know? That, in many doctrines, Christianity, well, certainly in my understanding of Christianity, though I was brought up in a very kind of, you know, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. I was dragged along to church, a very high church every Sunday when I was growing up, loathed that, decided in my teens that that was nothing, that I didn't want anything to do with that, kind of wandered back, had a spiritual experience and go, oh, hang on, there's more to life than I thought there was. And it brought me right back round to, oh, God, right. Okay. But surely, so in my in my experience, God was supposedly uh, perfect. But what we're actually saying right here is that perfect actually has a huge amount of imperfection. Right, right, because perfect means whole, right? So, so um, in Hebrew, uh, the when you say something like when Jesus says be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. We dumb that down and think morally good only, right? But it actually means perfect as an all-inclusive. So it's like the, uh, you know, you think of the Tai Chi symbol holding the yin and the yang, right? So God holds all opposites. That's the message of the tree of life, of uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's one tree with all these opposites or the Kabbalistic tree of life with all the opposites. So the universe is dynamic. It's, it's, it contains you know, all these, these um, 
uh, opposite forces in dynamic tension. That's how you get a creative universe, but it's all part of the same reality. So God holds the whole thing. So yeah, perfection just means uh, infinite wholeness. And, and you and I contain the same opposites. So it's not like you're going to be good only. I mean, that's not even, that's not possible, right? Because you don't know what good is without evil. They go, they go together. The question is, how do you deal with your shadow side? There's a, there's a wonderful, I mean, I was going to say, stop me if you've heard this, but you probably haven't heard this, but, but stop me if I go on too long. You know, in the, in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, chapter uh, 19, verse 18, he says, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. And the Hebrew Bible has no vowels. So we're allowed, it's part of the tradition, you can change the vowel sounds if you can make new meanings out of the consonants that are in the text. So uh, the actual Hebrew that you are taught to pronounce in that verse is ve'ahafta, which means and you shall love, l're'echa, your neighbor, kamocha, as yourself. And, but that's, that's, you're taught to pronounce it that way, but there's no vowels and you can change them. So there's a rabbi uh, in the uh, um, 1700s, uh, 1800s, uh, Reb Nachman of Bratslav, in Ukraine. And he says, you know, there's no reason why you have to pronounce it that way. Try this. He says, Ve'ahavta, and you shall love. Instead of echa, your neighbor, he says, say echa, your evil, kamocha, as yourself. He says, you have to love your evil, your shadow side, your dark side, as a part of yourself. Because if you don't, you're going to take that shadow side, project it onto your neighbor, and hate your neighbor. So if you want to love your neighbor, you have to love your dark side. Otherwise, you're going to project it onto your neighbor instead of owning it. You have to own your dark side. And this is way before Freud and, and <clears throat> Jung, right? So, so we have to learn to deal with our own, our own shadow side. A couple of thousand years almost before him, before Nachman, you had Rabbi saying, that you have to learn to channel your darker energies uh, to, to, what would you call it, to fuel your more positive energies, because the darker energies are what keep you grounded, because your lighter energies, your more holy energies, they just want to transcend, and the darker ones want to be embedded in this world. So you want to be able to blend them in such a way so that the rabbis, uh, ancient rabbis used to say, without those darker energies, you wouldn't get married, you wouldn't have children, you wouldn't have a, a you wouldn't engage in business, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't do anything that makes this life worthwhile. You just want to meditate and go up on a mountain. And that's not the Jewish ideal. If you didn't have the lighter side, then you just rape, pillage, you know, you do all these horrible things. So you need this balance. Uh, and you have both energies within you. You're born that way. You have to learn to bring them into harmony. You have to learn to love both. Uh, and, and doing so is what it is to be perfect, to be whole. So it's, we misread so many of these notions of perfection being one of them uh, to create imbalance when in fact they're challenging us to create uh, harmony and balance. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah. So, so, and I suppose what an example for, for those people listening, um, an example of that balance uh, of the darker energy might be something like anger. So, you know, anger might be considered to be a, a darker side of the human personality, but actually carrying on from what you're saying, the energy of anger actually gives us agency, gives us the desire to do something about whatever it is, blah, 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 blah. So that's really exactly what you're saying, that sort of example, isn't it? Right, right. And if anger, if it's not channeled towards something, you know, there's, there's just anger that's allowed to fester and it becomes fuel for doing evil. And then there's anger that's channeled into doing something good, you know, prophetic anger. Anger that's used to fuel um, social justice movements. Um, I don't know 
you know, if you didn't get angry about injustice, you wouldn't fight for justice. So you, you do have, there, there's a positive use for anger, um, but it has to be linked to something greater, something, you know, bigger than just, I want what I want and everyone else be damned. Yeah, because absolutely, because otherwise you're not getting the balance. You're just being very, very self-orientated on the right. ego level of, of of existence. Where 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 do you sit with with the understanding of um, say let's say maybe some of the um, less appealing thought forms or um, aspects of energy that is okay. Let, let me rephrase. I'll rephrase. Start this again. A lot of what I do is house healing. So we're going in and remotely working on the energy of a space. And we're basically asking the, the I call them the management from that's the description from the divine basically coming in and influencing the energies of a space. Quite often what we're doing is finding aspects that are pretty dark. They can be thought forms from somebody that has been suffering with depression or, or addiction or these sort of things. They don't necessarily need to apply directly to the person living in the space. But in that aspect of what I would call subtle realm entity, do you, do you have any experience of that sort of um, energy uh, in terms of existence or, or, or how you may have dealt with it in the past or have you, have you just never well, encountered that sort of thing? Well, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it sounds like, like some, you know, you deal with those things like feng shui, there, there's lots of different, you know, systems for working on that but but it's all it's all part of the divine whole i mean it right because god includes all yeah. those those forces yeah um there's a practice uh i haven't done this in a long time because i've lived in the same house for a long time and i'm not a congregational rabbi anymore where i deal with people who are moving into new apartments or into new flats or new houses um but there's a a, um, a ceremony that you do in judaism where someone moves into a new space and you bring, uh, you know, a friend brings, a family member brings outside who doesn't live in the space. You bring the person a broom, some bread and salt. And you use the broom to sweep out all the negative energies. You use to, the bread and the salt represents abundance and you know that kind of thing you, and you bring that in so you're sweeping out the negative you're bringing in the positive it sounds very similar because those energies are i mean they're probably always present but they're not always present in equal density so you know but the question i i guess i would have is is everyone equally capable of doing the sweeping and and my now in Judaism, they sort of my my guess is they would say, yeah, everyone can do this because it's just sort of a ritual. But in my own life, I would say no, that there are some people who are more um, not susceptible, more perceive more, they, they have the capability of perceiving these energies more uh, deeply. So they can they can perceive more subtle energies than maybe other people might so they can do a, a deeper clean <laughs> than, than other people might so it 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 maybe matters who you bring in to do the the ritual but um i i don't i don't find it on i mean it makes sense to me i don't know how to how to put it exactly. yeah okay but so these these, ex these energies exist and you want to work with them yeah it's, it's uh, yeah it's um just to round off that one is it's 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 more it's like yeah you, you people start on this the the process by thinking oh god scary 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 um and part of the teaching is well no they're not scary scary they have a place there's a purpose but they're just in the wrong place so they need to be moved along in terms of what you were saying about yes your experience is that some people are more perceptive and more a, you know able to see and feel and work with then it, it's really the way that i relate to it is it's just really like the absolute uniqueness of the individual 
taste you know the function of tasting food for example is utterly utterly unique and and separate and different but everybody still understands the process of of taste and right. and eating and right and so so every I, I think everybody actually can do the sweeping but as a, I, I completely agree with you that actually you're going to find some people that sweep better than others. You know, it's like doing a deep clean of a restaurant kitchen. Some people do a really, really good thorough job and other people don't necessarily because they're more inclined to, to do stuff. So wh where does the idea or the concept of Satan fit into uh, Judaism, should we say? Does it, does, does it even exist as, a, as, a, as an aspect? Well, it, Satan, you know, in the, in the Bible, Satan only appears in the book of Job, uh, and Satan operates as um, God's prosecuting attorney. So the role of Satan in, in Judaism, ancient Judaism, Satan sort of disappears over time, but it, it, Satan doesn't function at like the devil functions, and especially in Protestant, American Protestant uh, Christianity. But in Judaism, Satan, according to the book of Job, Satan would you know, circ circle around, wander around the planet, taking notes, who's doing what, and then come back and say, okay, this person's doing this. What do you want to do about it? God's the ultimate authority. Satan doesn't have any power other than to report back. Um, but are there satanic forces, you know, to take it away from an anthropolog an anthropomorphic, is there a being called Satan? I don't, I don't think so. Are there satanic forces? Are there, um, you know, is evil real? Well, evil is as real as good. I mean, it's part of the yin and the yang. It's part of that. It's part of that balance. So, so yeah, uh, that that is true. Is it intentional? In other words, is it conscious? Does it single people out? And I would say, no, none of this is conscious. I don't think, in a sense, I don't think God is conscious. I don't think God looks and says, ah, this person I'm going to reward and that person I'm going to punish. There was a horrible tornado that ripped through part of Mississippi in the last week or so, depends when you know, the podcast yeah. is aired. But there, there was a terrible um, tornado that tore through Mississippi and they interviewed this one guy whose family survived. The house was destroyed, if I remember right, and I may not, but he was talking about how he and his wife and his little baby, little child survived. I think they survived in a bathtub and he just thanked God for saving him and his family. And then that was the little interview. And that's very common. People say, oh, thank God. He, you know, God, he usually, he, you know, was watching over me. And then the newscaster reported in another newscast, like 20 minutes later, the same guy found out that his mother and father and brothers were killed by the same tornado a couple of blocks over. And of course, they don't run over and say, okay, now, thank God. No, now what do you think? It's because the theology isn't thought through. It's just an emotional response. But it's not like God saved this man, his wife and his baby and killed his mother and father. It's just, this just happens, right? So it, it, God isn't um, volitional in that way. God is this the infinite happening, and some of the happening is going to be, from our human perspective, horrific, and some of it is going to be terrific, you know, but it's it's got nothing to do with us. On the other hand, there is a different kind of evil of human agency. So, you know, we had that... Um, earthquake in Turkey and Syria, but in, but in Turkey. And the number I remember is something over 40,000 people were killed in that earthquake. And as I understand it, the reason so many people died in Turkey is because uh, Turkey had a building code that required builders to build buildings that would survive the uh, Richter scale impact of a, of the earthquake that they experienced but at some point it was the buildings that were poorly built at, you know illegally mm -hmm. built because they weren't built to code those are the buildings that collapsed and those are the buildings that in which the people died that's evil 
that's not the earthquake didn't do that right the earthquake had to happen because the earth has plates and the plates have to shift and when they shift there's a quake and if you're on the fault lines you're going to be in the middle of it the evil is the builder and the government officials who allowed the builder to build uh to to get away with building not building to code that's human evil that's that's real that's horrifying that's terrible but that's got you know, it's God in the sense that everything is God, but it's not God being volitional, but it's people being volitional. You have a, a, a chapter that starts with birth is an act of divine creativity. And that kind of sparked in my thinking that in that sense, that the wholeness, the happening that manifests that it is there to be experienced as and rolls through this concept that we have of time, which, of course, is when we get into that deep sort of mystical experience time actually is irrelevant it doesn't exist in that phrase but the the act of uh, birth is an act of divine creativity so, so on the whole notion of the nature of creativity or even the notion of creativity the the you know whether we call it god or universe or nature it's intrinsically creative everything I mean, the fact that anything happens is an act of creativity. And of course, creativity doesn't necessarily mean it's good. It just means it's creativity. Creativity can be positive or negative, And that will depend on the point of view of you know, the person who's making or the being that's making the judgment. But the universe is infinitely creative. and And so are we, because we're aspects of the universe. but but so are human beings. The question is, what do we do with that creativity? So, I mean, I, I, there was a, today is uh, March 30th, and in the New York Times today, I think it was today, um, there's an article about uh, tech moguls writing this letter about the danger of AI, artificial intelligence. And there's this uh, they're saying we have to we have to put a pause on this. I think they said six months, which is nothing, you know, really six months. But their concern is that there's a ten percent chance that artificial intelligence will destroy humanity. And and the example I heard someone use was, let's say you're getting on an airplane, and you go to the airport, and they tell you you're getting on a British Airways flight, and they say we just want you to know that there's a 10% chance that this plane is going to explode in midair. Would you get on the plane or not? Well, I wouldn't get on the plane. That seems a lot. But now they're telling you there's a 10% chance that AI is going to destroy humanity. Would you want to build, you know, let it run and let it, you know, do what it's going to do? And, you know, I'm thinking, well, you know, it might make my smartphone easier to use. Yeah, let it run, you know, let's see what happens. So, uh, you know, they're saying we should we should put a hold on this and see what what happens. Um, so not all creativity is good, but we don't know. You know, you just you just don't know. And that's I was going to say that's the interesting thing. Maybe that's the wrong way to put it. But creativity is fundamentally about the unknown and maybe even the unknowable. So if we actually, and I don't know if this is even possible, but if you could play it safe. I bet there would be no creativity. So life is not safe. And, and, and neither is creativity. So being alive is a risk. And, um, and it's part of the game. And, that's, and, and maybe it's a risk, risk worth taking. I, I, don't, I don't know where people want to go with that. But creativity is intrinsic. And with it comes danger. Because danger is, is part of creativity. But, but it's a really good point, and I know I I, I really must let you go. Um, but but it's um, it, it has been brilliant to talk to you. I would like to take that conversation further at some point. Perhaps if we can do this again at some point. I don't want to take too much of your time. No, but I, would, it's, I would love it's, to talk to you another time. That would be it's, great. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, no, so for me, for me also, Tim, it was really great. Oh, good man. Um, well, give my love to uh, Tennessee, wherever it may be. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I look forward to when we uh, meet again. But uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, take care. Uh, it, it was my pleasure. I'll, I'll look for you in the crowds in Foyle's War, which is my favorite. <laughs>